to the Brave Bold Brilliant podcast. I'm here today with John the Lord Bird. I've got the introduction Exactly right, correct. you've got it. <laughs> So, John, I mean, you're um, an absolute legend in terms of what you've achieved for homeless people and what you're doing now in the in the House of Lords. So it's really great that you've come on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, you twisted my arm. <laughs> you offered me a Kit Kat, didn't you? <laughs> Did I? No. <laughs> <laughs> but a Kit Kat. I will give you a Kit Kat any time you want a Kit Kat. I'm, I'm, I'm your girl. So we're going to start with your journey, if that's all right. A little bit about your background. Some people will know you. Some people won't know you so well. So I always like to start there. So, yeah, do you want to kick us off with where life started? How you've ended up in the House of Lords? Yeah. Uh, well, I was born to a London Irish family in Notting Hill. Uh, which then was ha, had the highest infant mortality rate than anywhere else in the British Isles. It was a terrible slum. It was a place where um, the houses were built, and they were brilliant houses, but they didn't sell in the 1870s. So they, you know, they um, filled them full of. They were bank declared declared bankrupt and sold by the courts, and then they were stuffed full of poor people. So by the time I arrived in 1946, just after the Second World War, it was a slum. And the sagging roofs, rats, mice, uh, you shared the toilet with eight other families. Um, you know, there was no bathrooms, there was no kitchens. There was, you know, there was nothing. And, uh, you know, rattling windows and everything was cold, freezing cold all the time, except in summer when it was boiling hot. Um, so it was a real, uh, you know, it was a real terrible place. And unlike a lot of slums that other people were living in, the slums of um, the north, for instance, mm. were often very, very poorly designed, cheap houses put up by a coal miner or, a, you know, a mill owner. Uh, but these houses were built for the bourgeoisie, for the posh. Oh. But they didn't arrive. Uh, and that led to uh, a situation where, they, as I said, they got sold. So you'd be living in a house with a roof as high as, with a ceiling as high as that, with, with ceiling roses, you know, an architrave and, and, you know, Corinthian orders wow. and all that stuff. So you kind of looked like, and to me, I didn't realise it then, but later I realised it looked as though, you know, we'd have... I was born in a kind of, uh, you know, um, extinct civilization. Yeah. And, and actually, when I was 22 or 23, I went to Pompeii in southern Italy. And I went to Pompeii, which had been destroyed by the volcano called Vesuvia, Vesuvius. And it looked like Notting Hill. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, God. I didn't realise. <laughs> yeah. So it was that kind of weird, weird kind of thing, you know. Gosh, fantastic. And, and so you, you, you were born there, and did you have a big family, like siblings? And, you well, know? Yeah, I mean, my... Well, actually, I have found out this is, this is a... I have found out... You don't mind if I have a couple of... No, of play, we've got to yeah. have a brew. <laughs> uh, I, I, I found out that... When I was 69, and I'm now 76, I found out that my dad wasn't my dad. So I thought I was half English and half Irish. And then I found out that my mum was playing away from home, uh, politely, to put it, yeah. uh, in 1945. So I'm the result of an Irishman who my mother, who was Irish, she was over in Ireland. So I'm, so the... The man who brought me up wasn't my father, though I loved him to death. Um, so I had mum and dad, and then I had three elder, two elder brothers, and then soon we had another three or, yeah. So that in the end, it was six boys. Gosh. And my mother was uh, not very good at the rent, and my father, or the man I thought was my father, was uh, liked to drink. Mm. So he would work very hard, but he would also go down the pub. So they never had anything. And uh, we were made homeless when I was five, and then again when I was six and when I was seven. So it's through non-payment of rent. And then I ended up in a orphanage. 
run by the Catholic Church, and I was there for a couple of years, run by the nuns. Came out, went in there, a kind of nice little sweet sort of geezer, and I came out a complete pain in the ass. Oh, you know, troubled and, you know, I mean, obviously I was under some kind of mental something or other. Mm. And I came out and I we moved to Fulham, got a council flat, and I just kept getting into trouble. So I was in and out of, you know, fighting at school and fighting with teachers. And then I was at the court for shoplifting, you know, juvenile court, and then house breaking and, you know, nicking bikes and then nicking cars and nicking uh, all sorts of stuff. I was a terrible nicker. Uh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, and so I was a really, and I was very aggressive. I used to, we used to do things like start fires. So I was in a gang. And in fact, uh, just near Chelsea football ground, there was an old station uh, which had been dilapidated. It was called Chelsea Football Grounds, Chelsea Station or something. And we burnt it down. Wow. Uh, and we burnt this derelict station down and we did, you know, all sorts of things. And we'd do all swastikas because everybody was still talking about the Second World War there'd be. So we'd put swastikas and bloody everything. So we were real. I mean, all my mates were tearaways like me because we gravitated towards mm. each other. Anyway, so I kept getting nicked and all that, and then I was being put into institutions, um, did a short, sharp shop when I was 14, and then later on went to a, a reformatory, which I ran away from and stole a car and smashed up at 102 miles an hour, which I found out later on was impossible because it only got up to about 87. But the... The police, when they went into court, said he was driving at 102 miles an hour. Anyway, we won't go into that. But I never got any compensation. Uh, so, and then I, I was put in a boys' prison where I learned to read and write. And it was, I mean, I could kind of read and kind of write, but not quite understand because mm. I was dyslexic as well. So I got all that and I came out of this prison, boys prison, put back into the reformatory. I thought, Jesus, you know, this is a totally different world. So I started to read and write, and then I started to paint and draw and doing all sorts of stuff like that. So when I got out, when I was nearly 18, I got a place at art school because I was so good. I mean, I was a genius, mm -hmm. uh, and I still am. Uh, and um, lo and behold, I got this place at Chelsea School of Art, but then fell back into the wrongdoing because I then met a young woman and I got married and had a baby and then I went back and I, it took me another, almost another decade to get myself out of doing wrong. And, and so, yeah, how did I get here? I don't know. <laughs> no, when I was 24, I applied at the, uh, at the House of Lords for a washing up job. So I came here when I was 24 and became a washer up. And at the time I was hiding from the police. So I was hiding from the police right in front of them. And I do recommend if you're gonna hide from the police, it's best to hide in front of them because they never think of looking. <laughs> anyway. Uh, then, uh, you know, after, and, and then I became a Marxist. I became a Marxist, revolutionary, anti-racist, all the stuff that I'd had when I was a child, you know, hating people because of their colour or their religion and all that stuff. I got rid of all that and it was brilliant. So I became a Marxist, but that didn't last too long because I found that most of the Marxists were middle-class children who'd, had a very, very hard relationship with a difficult relationship with mum and dad. So they seemed to be all, you know, kind of weird and posh. And I wasn't, you know, I stuck out like a sore thumb. So I didn't, uh, I didn't do well in the Marxist revolutionary movement and they threw me out in the end for being a thug, <laughs> uh, which uh, I think I was. I actually wanted to beat up racists and they wanted to talk to them. Talk to them. <laughs> I was only a bus. <laughs> Even though I'd been a racist myself. So, you know, I was one of those persons who'd kind of given up smoking and was going around, why are you smoking? Anyway, 
And then I, I became a printer because I'd learned some printing skills when I was in a reformatory. And it was really interesting that I could do something which I was really good at. And I I'd worked for other people and I wasn't very good. I was known as Bad Back John. Oh, my back, you know, oh, my back, you know. So I used to never employ me, never. I, I, anybody who employed me was a nutter. <laughs> and then I started my own print business and I was so good at it. I was brilliant. And I worked for all sorts of people like Pan American Airway. Oh, yeah. I did their work. I worked for the Royal Academy. I worked for the Albert Hall. I worked for these big publishers and the British Museum and the Tate Gallery and and I was just, I would work and work and work. And I would, you know, sometimes I'd start work on a Monday and I'd still be doing the same job on a Thursday and I hadn't been to bed. Wow. And I'd be like, a, you know, I mean, a zombie, but I, I loved it. And it was my passion. And, but the thing was, I only had one person working for me, which was a, a mate of mine and he was crap. Because he'd never turn, he'd, he'd say, oh, I'm, oh, sorry, I drank too much last night. You know, so often I was doing the, uh, doing the, uh, the work myself. Mm. So I wasn't much of a businessman, but I loved the work. And then I re-met a guy who I'd known when I was 21 called Gordon Roddick. And we had met when I was hiding from the police in Edinburgh. So I met him... Uh, when I was about 40 again, 41. And we talked and he had started the body shop with his wife, Anita Ronick. Yeah. And he went down, he didn't really have any time for me. You know, it was, it was like old Lang Syne and yeah. You know. So I kind of wrote him some rude letters and I said, could he give me some money from the, for the good old days? And he told me to piss off. Uh, and then he asked me, then he rang me in 1991, 1990. And he wanted me to help rewrite a book of a mate of his who'd just come out of prison. So I started working with him and then we became mates again. Then he went to New York and met and, and saw somebody selling a street paper walking down the street. And he thought, brilliant, why don't we have a street paper in, in, in London? So we then, um, uh, he, he then got the, the Body Shop Foundation to talk to all the homes groups. Mm. And they all said things like, well, why would, you, why would you want the homeless selling a street paper? Because they'd be selling a street paper and they'd be making money and then they'd be drinking it or putting it in their arms. And these are their problems. They've got so many problems that you've got to treat it this way. And so the, so the magazine was kicked to the side. Then in 91, just after the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, Business was flat, and I was working for an American publisher doing all their catalogs, and the checks were bouncing. So I was a bit short of money, and Gordon said, why don't you look at this street paper? And I said, all right, then, I'll do it, I'll do it. but I said, if I do it, I'm not gonna, it's not going to be a kind of white, middle-class, liberal thing. Mm. I'm not going to be told by any what to do. I'll work with them, and I'll only work with homeless people who get off their ass. And I'm not going to give them anything for nothing. They'll have to work for it. And he went, you're the best person. So I did a feasibility study, which was crap. It was just, I wrote, well, I'd never done a feasibility study. <laughs> so I just went to the library and looked at a feasibility study and just changed the words. <laughs> Fake it till you make Fake it. it right. Anyway, and then he gave me the money. And it was interesting that, we, uh, you know, we then started the big issue. There were all sorts, we did everything wrong. I mean, one of the biggest things was we believed the bullshit of the advertising industry who were advisors to us through the body shop. And they said, what you do is you don't make any money for the, for the paper itself. You make your money out of advertising, which is the same. So we sold the paper very cheaply to the homeless uh, we were selling it for 10p and it was costing 23p to make. Mm. But, and the advertisers who promised us didn't arrive. So we were left where the more magazines we sold, the more money we lost. Yeah. So 
Gordon was getting a bit irritated. And after like six months, nine months, he said, you've got three months. And if you don't uh, turn it around, you know, I'm not giving you any more money. So I then did a number of things. And within three months, we turned it around and we'd made a profit. So did you change the price, the whole pricing structure then and the whole business model around all of that? Yeah, I moved from the idea of this mystical world of advertising that was yeah. going to come. I said, no, we've got to make the money out of the street sale. So I doubled the price of the paper from 10p to 20p. It was selling for 50 pence. Uh, I got rid of all the posh paper that Anita Roddick wanted because it was... I don't think it was made out of plastic bags or something like that. It was very expensive. And I made it, instead of a big paper, I made it into an A4. And then uh, instead of having it what come out once a month, I did it twice a month and got the staff to work just twice as hard mm. and didn't get many more money. Uh, and we sweated like that. And within six months, nine months, we were making a nice little profit which we were then putting back into the magazine. Mm. So I did everything right. Uh, but the, my problem was I, you know, I'd only worked with one person in my life, and now I had 10, 5, no, sorry, I had 10, 15, 20, 100. Then I had all of these hundreds of big issue vendors who were looking upon me as a kind of father mm. or a, some kind of enforcer. And I was, I thought, you know. So sometimes I thought, God, I wish I could have some kind of accident and spend a month or two in hospital. Because <laughs> it was feel getting the too much. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Feel the pressure. But, it, but anyway, sorry, you're asking how I ended up in the House mm. of Lords. Then I started, I became useful because all those geezers, all those people who were getting into trouble in the city centres uh, were, you know, they were, you know, they were being antisocial and all that stuff. And we started to hoover them up and turn them into big issue vendors. And then they became well behaved because we appealed to their need to make money. Even if they were doing, doing that or putting it in their arms or up their noses, at least they weren't robbing your granny to do it. Mm. So then, you know, people from all over Britain, all over the world came to see us. So we started, then we started, you know, we were in London then we moved, you know, we started down in the West Country. Then we went to Manchester. We started the big issue in Manchester. We then moved up to Scotland and we moved to Ireland. And then we helped in France, in Germany, in Russia. We built a inter big issue international, which we called the International Network of Street Papers. So we built all this. And before you knew it, we were in North America, South America, Asia, Africa and, and Europe. Wow. The only place we weren't was the Antarctic and the, the other one, was it? The Arctic and the Antarctic. Yeah. And the reason for that was at the time, uh, there weren't many homeless polar bears mm. <laughs> or penguins. <laughs> oh. There are now, of course, with all the melting of the snows. Yeah, gosh, it's such a fascinating journey. And, and I guess what, what I'm interested in is how much of your early life and, you know, the, the sort of the, the difficulties that you had as a kid and growing up and in and out of trouble, how much of that ended up giving you the passion to start the big issue? Or was, was, it, was that not such a driver? It was just sort of a number of circumstances that led up to you starting it. Or did you find your purpose, you know? Was it, was it a light bulb moment where you went, this is what I'm meant to do in life? No, uh, no I mean, I think a lot of... First of all, if you look at the slums, and you look at that kind of life, it's not as bad as is made out. Right. If you can get out of it. So poverty is a curse unless you can get out of it. And if you can get out of it, you will learn more than any other human being, in my opinion. If you can go from need, and I bet you a pound to a penny, you will have come from need because mm. most people come from need. Mm. There are very, very few of us. All right, there might be some... Boris Johnson type people at the top who've never come from need. But most of us come from need. Or our parents or our grandparents. So that need, in a sense, strengthens you and makes you more connected with the world. So that's why, you know, obviously the children, people who come from need, who then get into the middle classes, they often have trouble with their children because the children are just sitting around 
you know, not not having that engagement. Mm. But they've they've got it, and I I really do believe that we've got to try and make that connection. I don't mean we should all be in poverty, but we've really got to connect with the world in a way that our children can get strong uh, and believe in things and not simply just believe in being consumers. Mm. And that's been one of the big problems. I mean, I've got five children and I've always struggled with them to give them uh, something extra than simply, you know, the latest gadget or something like that. Mm. And it is hard work if you've come from need. So when I look back at the time that I come from and my mother and my father and my brothers, I, I kind of feel, yeah, I, I was the luckiest person I knew. Largely because I had a big mouth and a big nose, which was always being broken. <laughs> I, I had a big mouth and I had an absolute passion and belief in myself from the first go. So there was something wrong. I mean, it's like, you know, I was walking out of uh, Pentonville Prison once where I just spent a kind of two hours taking the piss out of about 150 young men, largely young men, saying, you know, you're, what do you get caught for, you know? You're not very clever and all that. And, and making them hysterical with laughter because I was using laughter and just saying, you know, when you get out next time, why don't you try and sort yourself out? And I was giving them all sorts of advice that they were saying, how did you do it? And I was giving them all this kind of advice. And as I was walking out, the woman who'd organised it said to me, how did you get over your low self-esteem? And I said, what do you mean? I said, look, my problem is I've got too much self-esteem for me and about three other people. And poverty either destroys your self-esteem or it sometimes makes you a real pain in the rear. Mm. And I know a number of people, I've, I've had mates, who if they, if they hadn't been in crime and in poverty, if they hadn't got out of it, uh, you know, could have run the country, you know. So because they had so much self-esteem. And when you look at the kind of class system that we have, most of that self-esteem is bought. You know, you go to the right school, mm. you get the piano lessons and the ballet lessons and you get all the, you know, croquet or whatever else you play on the lawn. And all you buy it, you know, you go into the marketplace and purchase it. Mm. But most ordinary people, if they get it, they've earned it. And it means an enormous amount. And that is why it is so, so important that we free people up through education so that they don't start from behind and are actually coming into the marketplace where we all live and breathe because we're all selling ourselves into, into the marketplace. It's really, really important that people are not held back so that they can get a kind of good run at the, at the chance. So, no, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, I was unlike my brothers. And that's interesting because when I found out my father wasn't my father, I could kind of understand that my mum, you know, had a knee trembler. <laughs> Sorry, it's terrible thing to say. <laughs> uh, my mum had a relationship with someone, you know, I imagine in a station somewhere in, in, um, in Ireland. And so I got his stuff, you know, I got the... So I wasn't really the child of the slums. I was a kind of import, mm. even though I was born there. And, you know, I mean, the Irish are notorious for their ability to talk. And have I been... I mean, I'm not joking. I've been talking for 76 years. I haven't stopped. <laughs> Oh my Sorry, gosh. I'm sure I'm not answering your questions. So. No, it's all good. It's all good. No, it's fascinating to hear. So, so you know, when you you said you you were different to your brothers and to your brothers growing up, um, you're you're still in touch with with your with your family, are you? Yeah, today? I mean, some of them. I mean, one of my brothers is dead. The, my favourite brother, unfortunately, died. Patrick. Uh, he had some things when he was born oh. uh, around the heart. You know, mm. I mean, my mum was a heavy smoker, so. In fact, I, my mum said that normally her children took 10 woodbines to be born, and I took 20. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so with, the, with the, the brothers that you know, you're still in touch with today, what do they think of 
what you've achieved and compared to sort of their lives? Well, one of them, uh, the youngest, came and worked with me for 20 years or something, worked in the big issue. He started the, he started the, you know, working with the homeless and the distribution. And he was absolutely brilliant because even though he was much more working class than me, because I'd become posh and went to art school and mm. met posh people and married posh people and, you know, became the posh geezer I am now. He, uh, he kind of remained remarkably working <laughs> class and he was the, just the right person to go in and say, look, if you, if you screw around, you know, we'll just throw you out the door. So we, we weren't like a lot of charities. Oh, you know, there's no kind of bleeding heart liberals. You know. <laughs> and it worked because the homeless really respected us. So my youngest brother I've worked with, and he does a lot of the kind of work that I do now. And he does it in the north of England, largely. Okay. And then uh, my other brother, and then I've got a brother who's a, who, who was a window cleaner, and he's done very well for himself, and he's astonished. He can't work it out, you know, this little toe rag who was always, you know, I, I, I had a probation officer at the age of 10, you know. The big difference was I was always in trouble with the police. Mm. And every time I got nicked, I learned something. So I got my education in the prison system. And that's what separated me from my brothers who just got the enough education to put a shovel in the ground and dig a hole. Mm -hmm. And that was what was happening then. That was that class divided, you know, the 1944 Education Act, the Butler Education Act, which produced the secondary school system and the grammar school. And what they did was they creamed off 11% um, of the working classes and put them in grammar schools. And then the 89% who failed their 11 plus. Imagine having an exam now where 89% fail. fail. You, you, you'd be hauled before the, you know, the Universal Court of Human Rights. You mm -hmm. can't write off a whole generation of people, which no. they did. Yeah, absolutely right. Anyway, sorry, I'm wrong. No, it's all good. It's all good. So let, let's talk about the, the business side of things a little bit, because you said that, you know, you found your passion with, with, with publishing. Obviously, you had a strong reason why and a cause um, in terms of wanting to help other people get out of poverty. Um, but, and you started the business on your own with a little bit of support, shall we say. But then... You oh, know, no, the no. I got, I got Gordon Roddick and I... Gordon was so important to me... Because if you don't get the finance right, if I wasn't going to do a shoestring operation because I'd been involved in shoestring operations, you know, working with people in poverty, people coming out of prison, and it didn't go anywhere. And the thing about Gordon was he had a highly successful international business. I'd come out of the peppermint foot lotion revolution. You know, if they hadn't had all that peppermint foot lotion on the sale throughout the world, they wouldn't have had enough money to give me mm. to experiment, to fall, to rise, to fall, and to get it right in the end. And it, it, I really, I mean, the, um, obviously they wrote off against tax and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So the, you could say the, the taxpayer paid for the early stages of the big issue. Mm. But the support I got from Gordon was phenomenal because what he said, he said, and if I'm allowed to be rude, he said that a lot of people think you're an arsehole. They think you're a loudmouth, self-promoting scumbag. But as far as I'm concerned, you're my scumbag. And it, it, was, it was just what I wanted to hear. He said, get on with it. And he, he said, I won't tell you what to do. I, all I'll do is if the money runs out and don't come to me, you know, go somewhere else. Yeah, know. okay. So he was so, so he was a mass a massive uh, influence and more than a support, clearly well, just a huge I'd say more than the money, it was the fact that here was some bloke who said, I think you're doing the right thing. Mm. And you do need I mean, no one is ever self made. I don't believe in all that rubbish about self made. It's an opportunity that somebody presents to you. And then uh I mean, there's a great story by Arnold Bennett, and it's called The Card. And it's about a little guy whose mum is a cleaner, and he's a single child. And he is, you know, he, he kind of, 
does well at school and does that. And he gets a job in a solicitor's office. And then one day the solicitor, uh, the guy comes in and he's got, uh, he says, oh, I want to talk to the solicitor about collecting rents. And the solicitor can't be bothered, you know, oh, collecting rents. So little Denny, this guy Denny, pops out, runs down the road and says, I'll collect them for you. So here was a guy who then became, a, you know, a monstrously successful businessman, houses and all that stuff. Mm. But he, here was an opportunity. He didn't create that opportunity, he took it. Yeah. So he was a kind of person who, in my opinion, it's, the, you know, what, what is luck? Luck, you know, what is, you know, opportunity is the meeting of luck with preparation because he'd got himself there. Mm. So this guy, and in a way, everybody has to rely on the generosity of strangers, on that little bit of help, or maybe some reversal. It could be health, could be you breaking up with somebody, and then you're there, and somebody gives you the opportunity to kind of do something else with your life. Mm. And it is, I mean, I've never met a self-made person. And, you know, I've met Richard Branson and all these people, and, you know, they're no more impressive than anybody else. Uh, but what it is, is that they make the most of their opportunity. Yeah, and say yes. Yeah. Say yes when opportunity yeah. comes knocking. Yeah, absolutely. So so with the business side, obviously then Gordon was hugely influential in, in terms of growing the big issue. What changed as you went international? Because that can't have been easy to all of a sudden be, you know, be in Australia, America, all these different countries that the big issue expanded into. How, how did you have to change things in order to make that happen? We didn't really, because we did this very clever kind of, uh, uh, almost kind of, we said, right, we're here to help the homeless of London. Then we're here to help the homeless of Bristol, Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, Glasgow, Edinburgh. So we expanded that kind of thing. And then we created an international department, which was run by my ex-wife, uh, who was my wife at the time, and she did it wonderfully. So she was always popping off to places like Brussels and going to places, Spain and all that stuff. Then, you know, we got, I got this guy who was working with me in Scotland to go to Russia. Uh, so I, I could use those people. And then we started this network called the International Network, Street Papers. So it was really brilliant that wherever, you know, you, Poland or wherever. Mm. So we were always meeting people and we always worked with local people. So when we went to Africa, we worked with local people in Kenya and South Africa, in Namibia. Um, and then when we went to, you know, somebody came to me from Argentina and we sat, you know, in the airport for about three hours. I mean, they didn't even come into London. And I just told them, what I felt we could do for them and what they could do. And then they went back and they started Echo Buenos Aires, uh, which uh, was a, a magazine. I'm very happy as a, as a devout Catholic uh, that the present Pope blessed the big issue vendors who in uh, Argentina were called Echo Buenos Aires. But, wow. but so he, you know, he, he kind of blessed them and, that was a great moment because it was people were beginning to realize the importance of this idea of giving people a way of making their own money mm. so that they didn't have to, you know, hang around. It was a hand up, not a hand down. Yeah, fantastic. So, so it was a kind of division. And I was, you know, I went to places like America. I went to Japan, spent quite a bit of time in Japan. But only when the, the you know, the home business was strong enough. So mm. we made it. And I mean, the only thing we didn't do, which I miss, is that when I went to America and worked there for a couple of years, we used, I started something called um, social brokers. And it was, I'd meet somebody with a problem. Yeah. I'd meet somebody with a solution and I'd meet somebody with money and I'd put them together. And we didn't make anything out of it, but it was brilliant. Mm. You could see the magic of working in, you know, South Central LA or something like that with a lot of young black guys who weren't getting it. And you were, you'd, you'd put it together, sewed mm -hmm. it together, and then we'd work, move on. 
So we created this and then we started something called Big Issue Invest back mm. in the UK, which went from, you know, there to there. And it, the Big Issue Invest is bigger than the Big Issue now. But it's, you know, all the part of the same uh, startup, uh, the same company. And what was interesting was we were, we were innovating in investing in social businesses. Mm. And we've, in, you know, 500, 600 social businesses and, and ordinary businesses throughout the country have been helped and financed by us. And that's money that we've got from the city and high net worth and all that. It's not money coming from the streets. But the thing is that that's, to me, one big bit of the future. Mm. Let's get in there and create preventing businesses, prevent poverty. So, so the thing that I kind of would like more to, is to work, go back to Africa, but not necessarily to start street papers, but to start investing, helping them to create investments to, you know, in their villages and their small towns, mm -hmm. which give them work and give them education and give them skills. So that's my passion now. So I would have, I would like to see that work more. Yeah, more. and you've, yeah. You, I mean, it's a big number, isn't it? Because I was reading that you've already, had, you know, invested thirty million. It's probably much higher than that now, um, I expect. But it's a lot. Well, it's, it's it's much much more than that. Yeah, and and uh, you know, it's I I think I think there's about I don't know, is it three million or five million people's lives we've touched through. Big issue invest. Sorry. Yeah, it's a big number anyway. But I mean, that's it, isn't it? Talking about making an impact. You know, this podcast, yeah. Brave, Bold, you know, Bold is, is around impact. And, and that's obviously something that, you know, you've absolutely done. I also, um, I have a long-term vision around connecting business leaders and business owners in developed countries with developing countries, yeah. or, you know, and, and actually sort of being able to almost have a, a mentoring kind of, you know, business buddying uh, approach. So I think that's fantastic. And I actually am involved in the Prince's Trust, who also do, do oh, a lot yeah. in terms They're of their brilliant. entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, so, no, that's fantastic. And in Can terms I tell you my lovely Prince's Trust? Story? Oh, go for it. Yes, please do. Well, I met the Prince on quite a few occasions. Uh, and, you know, I found him very easy to, to work with. Uh, but there was, there was a young guy in The Big Issue, a young black guy, and he was suffering as a homeless person, suffering loads of racism. Mm. And not only racism by the public, but also racism by other homeless people, you know, because when you're homeless, it doesn't mean to say you've got a brilliant track record around goodness. Sure. Uh, and he then... Uh, applied for a job. He, we got him as a receptionist. He was so good at it. And we thought, you know, you're wasted here. And then we managed to get him a job in the Prince's Trust. And I walked in there one day and there he was, all smiling. And it was absolutely marvellous because we'd taken him from wretchedness. Mm. And the next stage of his development was the Prince's Trust. Amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, when you actually look back and and you think about all the you know the highs, the lows, is there any sort of particular highs that stand out for you um, in your kind the of? The first high I got was uh, about three months after we started, and I was I had to go and take a badge off of a very large guy because he was shoplifting and he was being abusive to people in Covent Garden, right in the centre of, of the big issues, you know, map of London. Mm. And uh, he was a real pain. And I was going to go down and take his badge off him, so and you can't sell anymore. And what happened was I was walking down, and just as I was walking down, I saw a copper walk over to him and give him a sandwich and a, and a cup of tea or something. Mm. And I thought... And then he was eating and was slapping each other on the back. And I thought, I thought, wow, this is weird. And I said, this guy is a complete pain in the rear and I'm about to deprive him. So then the copper walked off, shaking hands. So I followed him and I went up and I said, oh, I said, uh, uh, excuse me. I said, uh, um, I just see you talking to a big issue vendor there. And he said, he turned around and said, yeah, 
what's that to do with you? And he thought I was going to be a complainer. Yes. I said, oh, no. I, I said, I'm, you know, I started the big issue. Oh, you started the big issue. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And shook my hand and all that. And I said I was actually coming down to sort him out because he's been a complete... He said, oh, that was last month. He said, in the last month, he's completely changed. He's supporting people. He's been kind. He's been, he's, you know, he's really helpful he's, and all that. He has been transformed. Wow. And I thought, in a matter of... And what it was, it's a bit like you go to work... And you don't really want to do any work. And it's a job that you don't want to do. And then someone uh, takes a bit of interest in you and you kind of suddenly, oh. And then they say, oh, you're quite good at that. And, and then you, start, you you change because you're in the marketplace, mm. like as I was saying, all of us. And suddenly you think, hmm. And then your attitude. So this is what happened with homeless people. They started off being drunk and aggressive. Yeah, you want a big issue. But they found out the more polite and kind and thoughtful, the more papers they sold. Mm. And they were there to sell papers. And I often, you know, people say, I love it the way the big issue vendor, you, you, they offer you the paper. And if you don't take it, they tell you to have a nice day. Oh, yeah. They don't tell you to go and get stuffed. Mm. And that is a part of what we all use. You know, if you're selling a a company's products, you've got to make the, the public think that, you know, you're doing it in a kind, thoughtful way because that will mean you sell more of the products. Mm -hmm. So it's a very business-like attitude. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about the, the perception of homelessness um, and the sort of the, the image that maybe some people have around someone that's living on the streets because I guess some of that is probably justified, some of it is very unjustified. But what, what, what's, the, what's the, the sort of the, I guess, the profile, if you like, of, of your average homeless person or is, is every single person so unique that there aren't any kind of common, common reasons why someone ends up on the street or... This is where I kind of fall out with most other people. Yeah. Because I, I often hear anybody can be homeless. Well, that's true if you have mental health problems, if you have drink, drug problems, great leveller, or if, you know, your relationship breaks down and you, you lose the plot. Mm. You could end up homelessness. If you have a mental health condition, you're more likely, whatever position in life, you have started off and you could end up on the streets. But mainly it is a class issue because it's mainly people who come from, you know, the working classes, who come from the unskilled part of society or the semi-skilled part. This is my experience. Um, there are people who the one common denominator I've found amongst most people I've met in, in prisons, as well as mm. uh, in homelessness, is the fact they didn't do very well at school. And I'm typical of somebody who didn't do well at school. So you've got this situation where, you know, whatever you say, you could fall homeless if you had all of those conditions. But the people who move into homelessness are people who have started with a chaotic life, uh, poverty, long-term unemployment, social security background. A lot of those people, not a lot of them, but a number of them will end up homeless. Mm. So there is, so to me, the, the profile, this is what I, can't, I, I would say 80 to 90% of the people I've worked with who are in homelessness have these problems. And the other thing is the, the rootlessness, the fecklessness, the lostness, the not be able to kind of stick at things. Mm. Uh, we have helped many, many homeless people to kind of get somewhere. And then, and they've, they've done, you know, incredibly well. And then they've fallen back and they go through this revolving door. And that's because their restlessness and their fecklessness, they haven't got that thing that children should receive from their parents mm. to move on. And an enormous amount of people I've known uh, have come from the local authority care because even though it costs £100,000 a year on average mm. to keep a child in care, 
you would have thought they'd only spent five shillings on them because there is most of them come out at the age of 16 with the average reading age of a 12 year old <coughs> and they have all sorts of problems because and they have this problem of applying themselves i had enormous problems when i was growing up applying myself really i just couldn't do anything and it was only when when i was banged up and i started to paint and draw and read and write that i thought wow this is something and you know not being any better than anybody else and then concentrating and concentrating on drawing and painting and looking at stuff and reading did i become a person who was good at it mm -hmm. but i found my passion and then i found my passion through print and unfortunately a lot of the people we work with don't find their passion and if you don't find your passion you often you you you, you flake it through life yeah and, and i i'm not a psychologist so i I'm probably using the wrong language, but uh, I do believe if people find a passion, they tend to be able to weather all the storms that are thrown at them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, do you think homelessness is, is becoming more of an issue or are we making progress in the right areas? I mean, there's always more to be done, of course, in, in any, any sort of area like this. But what, what's your opinion in terms of where things are today versus maybe where they were 10, 20 years ago in respect of homelessness? Well, if you go back to the launch of the big issue in 1991, there was probably, I think, in the region of about six or 7,000 homeless people sleeping rough in the West End of London. Just in the West End? Yeah, London. you don't have wow. that now. No. Um, okay. London, Brighton, Bristol, Bath, these magnet towns. So you didn't get much street homelessness in Manchester or in Leeds. There is now mm. because homelessness has spread out. So actually, it does look as though there is more of it because it's all over the place. But the problem, the problem really is that the government and unfortunately local authorities and charities have dealt with it as, a, as an emergency. So therefore, they act in the emergency. Mm. You know, they try and get them housed and all that. There's very, very little prevention going the people, preventing people. Last year and the year before, the big issue did a, a, a very big campaign because we realized that we weren't the only ones, that in COVID what was happening was that people were losing their jobs yep. and then facing eviction. Mm. So there was a quarter of a million people who potentially could fall into homelessness. And that was frightening. And I was saying, that on the telly and the radio and in the papers, I said, look, you know, I work with 9,000 people a year. I don't want to work with 90. Yeah. And that's not even, I don't want to, I couldn't work with 90. What can I do with 90,000 people? Um, so it was, so we built this thing called Smash, which was say no to mass homelessness. And uh, eventually we got some money out of the government. We're still not sure I think it was 360 million to stop people falling into homelessness. The problem is people are still falling into homelessness, still being evicted. So it has not had the effect, but it raised the issue. And now homeless prevention is of major interest and major concerns because of COVID. We still haven't got over the COVID thing. I mean, even though, uh, you know, you'd have, you'd have thought we'd have been further down the line. But that's one, one thing. My opinion, it's all back to poverty. Mm. Poverty is the driving force between, behind social dislocation. So what you've got is you've got poverty. And poverty is poverty of spirit, poverty of opportunity, poverty of support, and all these sorts of things. And if you don't have a way out of poverty, then you're going to be there for a long time. And virtually all of the money that the government spends is spent on emergency and coping. Mm, so okay. it's like holding people's hands and very little on prevention and cure. And in fact, about 10 years ago, we developed this way of addressing this problem. 
uh, and that is called the PEC method, which is prevention, emergency, coping, and cure. So if you actually put this, uh, like almost a piece of film, over any project, and you ask the government, all right, where's this money coming from? Very rarely is it prevention. Very rarely is it cure. It's all emergency and coping. So what happens is about 40% of the money the government spends of the 1.1 trillion money that they get in from tax and then the money, some extra money they borrow, about 40% of that is spent in and around poverty. So if you look at the, the prison system, we spend three, three billion pounds a year, which is not a lot really. We could spend more and spend it on rehabilitation rather mm. than warehousing people. So we spend that. So, uh, so we spend a small amount on, on our prisoners so that we don't get them out of it. We spend 50 billion on schools, and yet we fail 35% of our children at school who take up, who become uh, the, the working poor, who end up in prison or homelessness, long term unemployment, depression filling up the A&E department and all that, and, and living a, p a poor life. So we, you know, 35% children, 50% of the money spent by the NHS is spent on trying to keep the poorest healthy, mm. 50%. That's nearly a hundred billion pounds a year. You look at the social security, social support thing, virtually all of that is poverty money. Mm. And then you, you, you look at, uh, uh, at employment, you look at the fact that we don't spend money on skilling people in their jobs to move away from poverty. Mm. So in my opinion, we live in a bit of an arsey versy using a printing term. <laughs> yeah. We live in a bit of an arsey versy world. It's upside down. And I'm doing a paper uh, which is a, a polemic against the way the government spends its money, which is called it's expensive keeping people poor. And it's, in my opinion, one of the best things I've ever turned my attention to because it's about breaking the system. Mm. You know, uh, you know, you stand in the House of Lords or in the House of Commons or, uh, and, and you listen to people going on about the government, not doing enough for people who are in poverty, not doing enough and all that. And you say, yeah, but, what do you want? You're just looking for top ups. You're not. Why are you not saying why can't we get these people out of poverty rather than making them as comfortable as possible in poverty, which no one will ever manage mm. because the poor are living on the edge of their lives. They're living in this permanent emergency. They get up in the morning. They don't know whether or not they can have a uh, can boil the kettle. Or, 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 you know, give Charlie the money to, to, to go to school. You know, they're living on the edge mm. and it's getting worse for more people. So in my opinion, we really desperately need to re-change our thinking. And we need to step back and say what works and what doesn't work. You know, they, you know Boris Johnson's fallen. Uh, he will be replaced by whoever. And I bet you a pound to a lump of whatever, uh, whatever. <laughs> I won't, sorry, forgive me, <laughs> lump of, I was going to say shit, but I won't. You can say uh, that. <laughs> uh, I bet you they'll come up with solutions. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're going to do this. And, and I, they will not achieve it because people have always got their solutions, always got their projects, always, but they get nowhere. They help a bit. Mm. I spoke in the house yesterday. Uh, there was a question, and the question was, how can we increase financial inclusion in Britain, in the UK? Yeah. And they're all, you know, they have their words. And I said, well, does the minister agree with me that if we fail 35% of our children at school who become this kind of underclass, mm. Is, it, is that going to be good for social inclusion? Sorry, for financial inclusion? Of course it's not. This is, this is the problem we've got. We've got a really old, 
almost Victorian cons way of looking at government, of looking at budgets, of looking at all sorts of things. We spend £50 billion pounds on education, and yet if we spend another £20 billion on breaking into the lives of those 35%, supporting the parents, because the parents have to buy into education before the child goes to school. Yeah. My parents had no idea that education was anything you could do anything with. So what, what did they do? They took me to the school gate and they said, we'll see you in 10 years time and we'll get you a job where you can learn a shovel. Mm. So I would always be in poverty. Yeah. And until we can skill people away. You know, we were talking earlier about the travel industry. Mm. The travel industry is one of the best industries for people going in at a very low level and working their way up, skilling themselves away from poverty. Yeah, absolutely. So that when uh, the the inflation goes from 3 to 12%, they're not saying, oh, God, mm. what do I do? Do I, you know, do I... Uh, do I turn off the gas? Do I turn off the electricity? Do I turn off the TV or whatever? Mm. So we've we've got to skill people away from that desperate level, and the government's not doing it because the government is thinking in the wrong way. Mm. And I, you know, it's it doesn't matter whether it's Labour or Conservative. They all come out and say, right, what we're going to do, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then and they're going to do that. And, uh, I don't know. And then after a while, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Sorry, excuse my friend. <laughs> and they're kind of saying, oh, well, we tried. You know, Blair comes in, Brown comes in, Cameron comes in, May comes in, Johnson comes in. Whoever comes in is always working. They, they're looking at government the way government has been looked at for, for 150 years. And until we stop and say, we're getting it wrong. We need new thinking. We need to dismantle poverty and not simply keep the poor slightly more comfortable. Is that, is that linked, do you think, to short-term thinking then? And just because of the whole, you know, you have a certain term in office, et cetera, and therefore, you know, to have, uh, to make material change, it's a longer process, isn't it, to go in and, you know, to actually tackle some of the grassroots issues that you've been talking about, which is quite hard to do that if you've got a relatively short time frame, potentially, in, in, in office. Yeah, but all right, then how do you build the channel tunnel? How do you build the motorway system? How do you build airports? Mm, okay, Every yeah. government has to plan long term for superstructure, for, mm. the, for the thing, for building airports, for building ports. So what they managed to do it, they managed to do it. In, I mean, for instance, all of the investment that has gone through 10, 15, 20, 30 years in developing a computer industry, in developing a stem cell uh, industry and developing all those other things. Mm. They are not done parliament to parliament to parliament to parliament. They're done over. So they managed to do it biologically. They managed to do it in terms building a hospital takes 25 mm. years to yeah. bed it in. Mm. So they're doing it. So they're doing it in other areas. So they're doing it in science, they're doing it in technology, they're doing it in health, but they can't do it in social justice. Yeah. And they look at it and say, I know what, uh, we'll try this new initiative. Mm. I met, I just met uh, an MP who was coming back from voting for Tom, no, for getting behind the Tom Tugano as the new MP, new leader of the Conservative Party. And I said, she said, you know, you know, she was telling me about it. I said, well, can you tell him not to come in with any solutions? She said, what do you mean? I said, he's going to come in with a load of solutions. I'm going to do this, do this, do this, do this. And he won't do anything. And that is the madness. Mm. It took me a long time to get into the British middle class. And when I got in, I looked at the way that they run the world. And it's a confederacy of dunces. It really is a confederacy of dunces. They couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery. I'm not joking. I am astonished at how bovine, and, and I am an uneducated or self-educated git on the side, 
And I am calling, in my humble sort of way, the emperor has no clothes. Mm. The emperor's new clothes are not there. And we need that. We need that. We need to dismantle poverty. And the role you play in the, in the Lords obviously allows you to have a strong voice and to, to lobby and influence. Um, is, that, is that sort of your big reason why now your big purpose around all the things you're trying to change in terms of legislation and government influencing at that level, as well as everything you do with the big issue? Well, in 2001, we had our 10th anniversary and I was asked by the Times, they said, oh, you've been doing this for 10 years. What are you going to do for the next 10, 20 years? And I said, well, up till now, I've been mending broken clocks. Mm. And for the next 10 and 20 years, I'm going to try and prevent the clocks breaking. So I set myself up as a person who was going to move the big issue towards prevention. And that's where Big Issue Invest comes in. Yeah. That's where all of the work that we do around the magazine and raising the issue of prevention, prevention, prevention. And then I think it was about 2013, I, I suddenly realized that a lot of people were describing me as a kind of saint-like person. And I'm very unsaintly. If you've seen me in a pub at night, <laughs> I'm far from being saintly. <laughs> uh, and the thing is, what they were saying is, ah, that John Bird, he really knows how to think outside the box. And I thought, and it was in the middle of the night, I thought, well, the only reason for that is because the box isn't working. So the only reason you have to work outside the box is because the box is crap. Mm. And I realised that the box was Parliament. So I thought, I'm going to get in there. So I applied uh, through Tony Blair's, um, uh, he had this system which is called People's Peers, and it was cross benches. So I applied, you know, I went for interviews and all that. And um, for the first time, I went to an interview and got a job out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever, if I ever did an interview, I never got the job. Anyway, so I went, to, I went there and I applied. And after a couple of years, I got accepted. I was the most unusual person, an ex-offender, an ex-heavy you know, drinker, an ex-rough sleeper, an ex-pain in the arse, uh, you know, an ex-washer up in the House of Lords. Uh, so I was a very unlikely person. But I think they took a bet on me. And I went in, but I went in when I was asked what I was here for. And I said to, I said to slit the throat of poverty, not to make the poor comfortable. Mm. I, I loathe having people in poverty because I don't think their lives are, I think it diminishes the human, poverty kills the human spirit. Mm. So I said all this and I went into parliament to, to do exactly that. The problem is virtually everybody else is obsessed with the emergency, emergency, emergency. And I keep saying, well, actually, if you did something other than that, you might reduce the amount of people in the emergency. Yep. And you could do that. So we've got to deal with the emergency. You can't, somebody falls down on the street, you've got to pick them up. But wouldn't it be better if we did stuff at the same time? Yeah. That's why you need prevention emergency, coping and cure. And any government to get that must need it. And unfortunately, you're right when you say they move. The problem with politics is it has very, very little to do with delivery. Mm. It is about surviving on the slippery, you know, the slippery pole of, of, poli of how do you stay in office? How do you keep your job? How do you keep your constituency happy? How do you do? So that is a series of kind of throwing little, you know, kind of sweets to them or something like that. Yeah. So you, you're constantly nervous about how do you get your job and all that. And you see all these MPs and they're dead nervous because they don't know. They don't know that they could be out. And I meet MPs who have been out of office for two or three years and they're, they're like recovering. I had a job once. I, I was in Parliament for five years or ten years. Now, now I'm doing, you know, HR or whatever. I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. They got some other job, but they the job they wanted they lost, 
Uh, and even though it's the most neurotic place for anybody to be, until we create something which we still have not done, we, if we realize that representational democracy is only one part of it, until we see that participatory democracy creates a stronger democracy, when we work within the communities, when we build up, the, when an old age pensioner or, or somebody who's ill in the community is supported by the community. When we grow this, this, this participatory democracy, then we strengthen the whole political system. The other thing is, we do seem to get some pretty weird people going into politics. <laughs> I am astonished. They, most of them have had a, a charisma bypass. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I look at them and I think, you know, they're like talking to tennis players or golfers. You know, you talk to a golfer and they talk about golf. Do they do anything else? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rubbishing two wonderful sports. But I do think, I think, God, uh, why, why are they, you know, why are they those kind of people? Why do we keep choosing these old Etonians? Mm. Why do we keep choosing people who, uh, you know, uh, you know, you'd feel they... They're just kind of communicators. Yeah, more diverse and representative. Yeah, like where, are, Joe, yeah. where are yeah. our nurses? Not our top nurses and our doctors. Where are our nurses? Where are our firemen? Where are where are our fishermen? Where are our, our uh, you know uh, workers? Where and because we don't, mm. where where you know somebody who's run a small business, rather than you know we get all the kind of hierarchy of, you know, uh, where are the priests rather than the bishops? Mm. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know. I totally agree with you. I mean, the point is, right, you know, be the change you want to see. And that's obviously what you're doing, doing fantastically well at. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. And I would let you. <laughs> But I am conscious that you've got a very busy day ahead. So I am going to just above. finish with a couple of final questions, if I may. Go on, then. If I may. So when you look back over your illustrious 76 life, years. Life and, yeah, career and uh, the highs and the lows, can you think of the best piece of advice you've ever been given? God, I'm not very good on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of the advice I've been given is crap. Uh and I can honestly say that it's given sometimes by the best intentioned people. Mm. I, I, I give my own, I only take my own advice. I say when I go to schools and I often go to schools, this is obviously pre COVID. I always tell people you've got to, whether you like it or not, find a way where you distinguish yourself. I don't mean you become, you know, a, a part of the hierarchy but you distinguish yourself. It doesn't matter what that is. It could be gardening. It could be painting. It could be repairing things. It could be, you know, driving. It could be cars, repairing cars. If you can find something to fall in love with, you find that life opens up to you mm. and you can find all sorts of wonderful things. I was very, very pleased to hear that... Uh, um, the comedian, uh, what's his name? Uh, the one who does Mr. Bean. Oh, uh, Rowan Atkinson. Rowan Atkinson. I mean, he's a comedian. He does all that. And he does a brilliant job and he's in films and all that. But what he is, is an expert on Range Rovers and Land Rovers. Is that right? Yeah, apparently. I'm, this <laughs> is what I've been told. And he really knows everything about the little bit. And when you get that... When you meet somebody who has a passion for things, and, and you know, he'd make a good Range Rover dealer <laughs> if, <he's, laughs> if, he's, uh, if his business goes down the toilet, you know, uh, his other thing. So in my, I always say, you know, we have to find something. And it might be kicking a ball against the wall. But if, if you do that and then you embrace it, it makes you stronger makes you deeper, it makes you, in a way, even more human. Mm, yeah, follow your passion. Find a passion and follow it. Exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad you came. <laughs>
<laughs> so am I, so am I. Right, so I, I was going to ask you, is there a piece of advice that hasn't gone so well for you? But you said there's every every advice is bad, so I probably won't well, be no, asking I that mean, question. Some of the advice I got, <laughs> but the advice my mum gave me when I got a place at art school, she said to me, you're working class, you'll always be working class, and working class people don't go to college and uh, they don't do things like art, you know. You've got to go back on the building sites, and that's that. And I, and I said to my mum, piss off. Uh, <laughs> I did. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so that was... But No, I'm not very good on that. And what I'm really interested in is when you meet people and you take an interest in their lives, they become enlightened. They, yeah. they light up. They become... So I'm very, very interested in other people. And even though I'm a bloated egoist, I, I, I love meeting people. I love talking to them. I like to know where they come from. And actually being an ex-cab driver, mini-cab driver, I always want to know where they live. <laughs> it's not because I'm going to go around and rob their house, but <laughs> it's because I want to say, oh, yeah, I've been there and all that stuff. So I find that, that communality, to me, uh, I'm not the world's greatest listener, but I do listen to people who I believe are, are, are in a sense, looking to, you know, they want to make more of their lives. Mm. And that's, that's a really interesting thing. Yeah. And um, I, I feel that there are not enough people in this world who look out for the well-being of others. Uh, they are, they're, sorry, there are enough of them, but there's no light shone on them. Yeah. And I think when you talk to people... I mean, I know people who, I know a Polish cleaning woman who, she says, I don't like this job. So I said, what do you want to do? She says, I want to work in, uh, with old people. And, and she's got a wonderful heart. So she mm. went and worked with old people and she gave up the cleaning job. The cleaning job earned more money because she was running a team of them. But she went in and every, every time you see her, She's not that miserable, worn down person. She's somebody who every time she helps somebody, she feels more human. Yeah, amazing. amazing. And it is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. You know. Wonderful. So my last question, if I may. Good. Is, <laughs> the podcast is called Brave, Bold, Brilliant. So what does that mean to you? Uh, they could all be cliches. Uh, brave. I don't think anybody's brave. I think they're brave at times, and I think they're as frightened as the rest of us at other times. I think the best time I've ever done anything meaningful in life is when I've been at my most front. Mm -hmm. And I've never, and the bravery in a sense, you start realise afterwards, you've stumbled into it. A couple of years ago, I was on the platform at my local station, and as, and the doors open and all these young kids, lads, poured out, you know, about 17 or 18, and they were kicking one human being, one boy. So I jumped in and I effed and blinded, ah! You know, and I, I looked like a lunatic, like, and I pushed him behind and I said, Fuck. you know, and I was really a good, and they all kind of, they all just ran down the road and I put the guy back on the train. I was frightened, but I hid my fear mm. in my anger. Mm. But I got back and I thought, God, you've still got it. But so that thing about bravery, so I, I worry about that. Bold. What was the next one? Bold, bold and brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I've done some bold things, but then if you go, if you say I'm going to be bold, I, I don't, I think boldness comes out of, of, you know, assessing where you are, what's going on and saying, I've got to do this. And I think if you say that, then you get the, you get the kind of, you know, the grit to do it. Mm. I've been bold and I've been unbold. Uh, if I hadn't been unbold, I wouldn't know what boldness is. Yeah. So it's never, you know, it, how many times have you met somebody who's trying to impress you? And then suddenly they walk down and they trip over and they fall down <laughs> and you laugh at them. <laughs> he was bold. And now he's fallen down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> There's a yin to every yang, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And what was the other one? Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, the most brilliant. 
things are often the most simple and you have to go over them again. My big, in, my big problem, my big piece of brilliance at the moment is looking at the fact that whatever we are doing at the moment about climate change or about social justice or about, you know, um, you know misogyny uh, and all that, whatever we're doing, we're not getting it right because we're not reducing it. Mm. We're not reducing poverty. We're not doing all these things. Uh, and I realise that the, the, the most brilliant thing I can say is we're not doing the right kind of thinking. So let's find the, the right kind of thinking. Mm. And it's not coming out of the government. It's not coming out of charities. It's not coming out of brilliant individuals. It's coming out of, if it's coming out of anything, it's us learning that the world is changing, that what's happening in Ukraine and, and Russia and what's happening in China and all these sorts of things are all le opportunities for learning. Are we going to learn to do this thing better than our forefathers? Because they didn't do a particularly good job, did they? No. Absolutely. Well, thank you ever so much. It's been an absolute joy. Um, we could have chatted even longer. Thank you very much. She's, it's a wrap. She's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know.